Hello, everyone. Welcome to Small Talk. Well, if this this is the first time you're watching the show, my guest has been on before, and she was talking about her, a situation she was in, uh, domestic violence. And so we're just going to uh, start where she left off. Give her. She's going to just do a little bit of a recap, maybe, and then continue her story. So, ladies and gentlemen, Curry Benjo. Welcome back, Carrie. Thanks for having me back. Um, just a. It was a very lengthy part one and two, part two, but basically I lost my left leg due to domestic violence. And um, I'm an amputee. I'm very visible with my amputation. I don't cover it up. I still wear dresses. I'm still myself. I'm still the same per. Well, I guess I'm not. I'm a little different than yeah. before. But um, this part is going to be talking about the recovery, the after um, after making that tough decision of of amputating my leg below the knee. And um, it took a lot, you know, because I always thought my legs were my best feature. You know, people think, oh, you know, like they have a really great body, but I always thought my legs were my best feature. And so to lose one of them was very traumatic and I really connected my legs to my femininity. And for the longest time, I didn't know how I was going to get out of that, that darkness. You know, I was brave still. I was mm -hmm. trying to be positive and moving forward. But on the inside, you know, it was really tough. It was really, um, I lost my leg in the winter. So it was coming up spring. And I had to make a decision of whether or not I was going to start wearing pants because I'm the type of person who never wears pants. <laughs> I also have dresses, skirts, um, leggings, um, very feminine. And so I didn't even own a pair of sweatpants. That's how much I didn't wear um any type of long pants to cover my legs and so I had to make that decision of whether or not I was going to change my complete style because that's what it would involve and hide my amputation because I could have they told me that they could make um a foam covering that would mimic my other leg mm -hmm. and so as long as I wore pants people wouldn't be able to tell and so, but I thought, you know, I was given this story and unfortunately, a lot of women who go through this, you know, their scars are on the inside, they're hidden, mm -hmm. mine are out there. And I thought, you know, I was just going to embrace this new me. And if it started conversations about this domestic violence, then so be it. I was willing to take that on. Um, one of the promises I made to my mom was that I wasn't going to let the amputation um, stop me because she was always very proud of me and the fact that I was a working journalist. I was the first um, Indigenous person um, hired at the Regina Leader Post back in 2006. And so she was really proud of the fact that I was making inroads, you know, making something out of myself. And so every success, I think, was her little success. And so I think she really feared um, what would become of me if I didn't have that outlet. And I promised her that, you know, this is not going to change. You know, I embraced it. I took responsibility. I made the decision to amputate my leg. I made the decision to be very public with it. And so taking on that, um, sort of responsibility gave me a little bit of, of, of push, you know, I had, I spoke the words, I said the words. And so I had to follow through with my, with my actions. And so I think the first time I ever went out in public with my leg, I had to make a decision whether I was going to wear um, pants and boots, but it was getting warm and I really wanted to wear a skirt and I put on an outfit and I, I looked in my mirror 
and the very first leg you get is really um, quite ugly. It's um, it's covered in plaster molding. So it's this really big bulky thing okay. with a little um, rod and a foot and it's not pretty. And so I put on my mini skirt and um, a sweater and I looked in the mirror. I did my hair, did my makeup and I looked at the mirror in the mirror and I had to really um, pump myself up. You know, I ha really had to get used to looking at myself. I didn't like looking at myself. Like the very first time um, my leg was amputated, I didn't look at it for the first two weeks. Right. I just refused to look at it. And then when I made that decision to be public with my leg and go out there and just, you know, be exposed and show um, my disability, right. I had to really um, talk myself into it. I took a lot of mirror exercises, you know, just looking at myself, okay. getting used to myself. And so the first time I went out, I went to the grocery store and I got some stairs, but most people didn't look at me, you know, because I walked um, very well. People don't notice I have an amputation until, you know, they, it's pointed out or they, they were sitting down or something or until they notice people don't, when I walk into a room, people don't really look at it. And so I was walking around um, shopping and stuff like that. And um, somebody dropped a piece of something and they, they bent down and they picked it up and they looked at my leg and they're like, oh, I wouldn't have noticed you had one of those. You walk so well and you carry yourself so well and you look so beautiful. And that was one of the first um, interactions I had. And I don't know if it was just, um, you know, what I needed yeah. to yeah. hear because I was so nervous about being out there. And then somebody just random stranger just came and told me that I looked beautiful nice. and that they didn't notice. And, and so it was building up. And one of the things um, I, I didn't mention is um, I promised myself that I wouldn't pass up any opportunity because living in that situation, I changed and I, and I modified and I didn't push myself to be anything more because of a fear of, you know, yeah, yeah. making that other person feel like insecure about his position. And so I held it back. I didn't, I had opportunities come to me and I would just like, you know, let them pass by. But after being in that hospital bed and after facing um, possible death, I uh, I decided that any opportunity, if I could take it, I was going to do it. My, my motto has been, I'll say yes, and I'll figure it out later. And that's how I've been um, walking in this world since then. I think it was February. I only had my leg uh, maybe two or three weeks, three weeks at most. And I was invited to a, a luncheon and they were recruiting members or people to take the um, master's program at the U of R. And so I was just in the beginning of my healing period, got this offer and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this. And so I went for my master's while I was still recovering. Um, from my amputations, just getting used to being an amputee and and it was where I needed to be. You know, I met yeah. and I really fell in love with journalism again and I fell in love with learning. I was around people that never knew me and just it was such a um, uplifting experience mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it was also what helped build me uh, along the way. And I got my master's during the pandemic. So there wasn't no grad ceremony. I went and picked it up at the uh, Language Institute, lined up, took it, and that was it. Um, and that was fine. I have the piece of paper. And then I went to work, back to work, went back to work in a newsroom and something I didn't think I would be able to do. And I did. And right after that, 
I decided that I didn't, having went through what I went through and then um, getting my master's and having this new vision of what journalism could be and my impact in it, um, I took on the operation of Eagle Feather News. It was a, it's a provincial newspaper that's distributed throughout Saskatchewan. And the founder uh, publisher was retiring and he wanted somebody to take it over. And I was like, um, I'll do it. And so I jumped into that and 2021, I was the new editor in chief and co-owner of Eagle Feather News. And I've just focused on building that platform, building, making sure things got done. And it was really empowering to just, you know, be the master of my own destiny, yeah. you know, yeah. to just embrace all these challenges. And these were things I wouldn't have considered prior to. I prob probably would have, you know, if I didn't meet that person, didn't go through all that trauma, didn't lose my leg. I probably would have been really content just working at the leader post and, mm -hmm. you know, doing my job because it was fulfilling and I love that job, but I was changed, you know, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, internally, I wasn't the same person. Um, there's this Taylor Swift song and it starts out with Taylor can't come to the phone and right now. Why? Cause she's dead. And, and so that's kind of how right. I feel, you know, there was this metaphor morphosis, right? You know, it wasn't just, I cut up, my leg got cut off and, you know, I lost who I was. What it was is I cut off a part of, you know, that, that past. And so it was up to me from that point to decide what kind of future I wanted for myself and what kind of future I wanted for my children. And what kind of future I was going to show my mom that I could do. Because one of the things that really upset me was that I made her cry. She was like the strongest woman I knew. Mm -hmm. And she never cried. She didn't cry when, at my dad's funeral. She didn't cry when she buried her children. And so I'm sure she cried in private, but not publicly. But yeah. to see her openly cry when, she, when I was on that hospital bed, knowing what I was facing... I I was determined to never make her cry again. Oh. And um, I think I kept that promise. She passed away in June. And um, just this past June? Yeah, June 17th. Yeah, sorry for their loss. Yeah. Yeah. And so since that time, you know, like every little milestone I reached every little accomplishment I would always share it with her um, so that she knew and she felt a little better about me my life and you know the decisions I made and one of the best compliments she told me was that she never has to worry about me and uh, because she was always such a, a mother a caregiver and stuff okay. and I felt proud that I gave her that confidence that she didn't have to worry about me. And so I've all, I've continued that, um, that journey, you know, of just um, not looking at situations as um, why me kind of thing. I look at it as an opportunity to learn something. So when I, I lost my leg, I was like, I could have been really depressed and thinking yeah. you know poor me my life is over this and that um I had a lot of time to sit and think um and I wondered you know like why did this happen and then that why turned to what lesson is in this what can I take from this to improve my life and so I've taken, you know, this, this story and I share it with others in hopes of, you know, reaching other women, um, other victims, because there's 
it doesn't matter your gender. You could be a victim of domestic violence. And, and, um, and so I share my story. And, and unfortunately for me, um, I can't ever hide from that. So instead of trying to hide it, I just embrace it. Mm-hmm. And instead of, you know, taking on that image of, you know, I'm a victim, I'm poor, I'm helpless. I, d- I don't look at it like that. You know, like I look at it as I'm a survivor. You try to break me, you know, and you couldn't. And so I think I get that from my mom, you know, cause she was so, she was so tough. Yeah. And so I, I followed sort of how she carried herself. She never let anything like drag her down or make her feel like inferior. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I've always carried myself. And every, every time I start to feel that sense of doubt, um, I, I turn inward. I look at myself because a lot of us, we don't look at ourselves. Um, I look at myself in a mirror and I really, really look at myself and and I don't hate that person. So why should I mistreat myself? You know, like when my grandchildren, when my grandchildren look at me, the person they see is somebody, um, you know, amazing. Probably like the way I looked at my mom, the way my kids look at me, they, all they see is love. And so I try to look at myself the way they look at me and be that person that they see. And so one of the things that I think um, has really helped Mm -hmm. is that self-love approach, you know, loving myself enough to take care of myself, loving myself to treat myself, loving myself enough to take myself out for lunch, you know, to treat myself, to take, I take myself out, out on dates and I do it by myself because really yeah (laughs) yeah uh, like at the end of the day you know when when we leave this world we're by ourselves Mm. and so I really embrace um loving the individual Mm -hmm. and um and I've I've I reflect that in my life you know yeah um prior to Mm. um I like I always dressed up and I did um take care of my my outer self but after you know the amputation and stuff like that I started taking a little extra care like I get my hair done I never did that before I never ever got my hair done in the salon I did it myself um I go for a facial um I started wearing makeup I I went on YouTube and learned how to put on eyeshadow and (laughs) all this stuff and uh and so it's just those little things of making myself feel pretty because I shouldn't depend on somebody else to make me feel you know that goodness you know like get those compliments yeah I give it to myself and uh pretty cool and I think a lot of it's not being selfish and it's like self-love for me, it was self-preservation. You know, I needed to keep something there that was um, still me, you know, something that I can cherish, something I can love and, and loving my image is really important, especially when you have uh, a very visible disability Mm -hmm. and I think that just um emanates once you embrace yourself your differences your um shortcomings or whatever Mm. and you don't let that define you I think that it it gives off an energy that other people sort of begin to treat you the way you put your your energy out there. Right. Yeah. Um, I haven't had anybody insult me. Oh, that's nice. I haven't, 
I haven't had anybody say anything about, you know, the fact that I don't have a leg. I get stares, kids stare, people stare. Mm-hmm. Um, but as much as I get that, I get the other side too. I get the people that just like look at me and smile, you know, and they're like, and they compliment me and they, nice. and they're, they uh, balance out that negativity. And so rather than focus on those people that stare at me, uh, I concentrate on, on the, the other side, you know, I give the, the other people that energy right. and um, I feed that instead of the, the negative. I was just thinking about, you know, I've been watching the, the Paralympics and, and all of those people putting themselves right up there for the world to see, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's what, I think what you're doing is so, so wonderful. Really, it is. You know, what they do is like, look at me. I might have this issue, this, this no leg or whatever it is, but I can still do everything I want to do. To yeah, s- I know. Never- um, I never thought I would be a business owner. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. I never thought I'd be um, my own boss. There you go. <laughs> and so as much as it's changed my life, there's a lot of things I can't do. Um, I can't go swimming. Um, I can't walk on a beach because of um, I need a solid uh, yeah. ground. Uh, yeah. I can't walk uphill because my foot doesn't bend. You don't realize how much you need your foot to bend to like right. Right. Um, climb things. Mm-hmm. And so I can climb stairs as long as they're solid. And so I do the things that I can do, but there's still a lot of things I can't do. And mm-hmm. it's really funny because people ask me stuff and uh, they they completely forget that I, I have a disability. Like, uh, ask me if I'm going to skydive. And I'm like, uh, no, I might break my other leg. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, because I'd have to take off my leg. And then I'd land on one leg. <laughs> and then how am I, when I'm on the ground, how am I going to put on my leg? And they're like, well, can't you just like keep them both on? I was like, no, I don't want to risk breaking my leg because um, a prosthetic is really expensive if you actually look at the the cost of it okay and um to get one that fits Mm -hmm. well is is gold you know like i'm lucky here that they they produce them right in in town here and so i i've i've had to get it um i've gone through a number of legs and you know it gets cast it's get it gets molded and they it's it's made to fit me perfectly is what I'm saying. And yeah, um, yeah. and if I didn't have such a, a good prosthesis, I don't think I'd be as as um, mobile, uh, mobile as I am. Right. Which is some of the, the people that have prosthetics, that it's a metal thing that I see. Yeah, that's for, I can get, get that kind if I wanted to do more walking. Oh, okay. You know, like if I want to do um, running and stuff, mm-hmm. um, it has a little more bounce. Yeah, yeah. So if I wanted to like climb a hill with that, I could, ah. um, I haven't, um, I wasn't that physically active prior to, yeah. um, so mm, going hiking isn't really high on my priority list. Okay. <laughs> I think it's been great. Um, so I think we'll end it there, but I want to talk to the audience, you know, if you've missed the first and second episode um, you can go to my YouTube channel, it's just at Nancy Guitar 625 and just put in Carrie Medjo's name and, and you'll know, get the beginning of her story because it's really important to hear the whole story. And as Carrie said, it's a little bit long, but you think about a life story like that whole span, Carrie, from when you were first in that domestic domestic violence situation to losing your leg. That didn't happen in 20 minutes. That didn't happen in an hour. It took a long time, right? So- yeah. So virtually that that length of time that you took to tell your story is minutes compared to you going through it from the beginning to where you are now. Anyway, I want to thank you, Carrie, for for sharing your story with me and with the audience. And to the audience, um, 
thank you very much for watching the show. I hope you really continue to do so. And if you're like somebody who who just recently lost a limb for whatever reason, I'm sure if you contact Carrie, you know, you can talk to her about that, right, Carrie? Yeah, definitely. If they have if you have any issues, you don't know how to proceed or or to build yourself up or whatever it is, you know, she's on on uh, Facebook. You can definitely find her there and uh you can look for just Google um uh, Carrie Benjo, managing editor at Eagle Feather News. So I'm sure that'll come up as well. So um, there you go. So there's lots of contact for you to reach out to her if that's what you need to do, or just give her some nice positive feedback. That's that's always cool too. Anyway, thank you everybody for watching the show. Take care and peace out. Thanks, Bye. Carrie. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate you telling your story. It's just so tremendous, you know, really was. And, and as always, you're always welcome to back on the show anytime you want. If you have something to share, you know, please just contact me and I'll, I'll book in. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you, yes. uh, we do a reconciliation ally feature on Eagle Feather News. And um, I'd love to profile you sometime. <laughs> just so you know. Because, probably, because I've, sorry, because I've seen your... Um, You've talked to a lot of other Indigenous people. Um, I've seen Raven Reed. I've seen other people that have appeared on your podcast. And I think that's really cool Thank that you. you're taking the time to share Indigenous stories on your platform. And I and I think that is a true um, um, showing of reconciliation when it comes from the individual, when it's not government implemented, government funded, and it's not your mandate. I And you do it out of your own heart. I really think that's reconciliation. Thank you. It's important to me. It really is, you know, that that because I have relatives who are First Nations and and when I think about anything negative, like uh, whether it's a day-to-day -day thing or the re or the residential schools, it makes me crazy inside, you know, that this is my family. So it's important for me to, you know, to have anybody. But yeah, I'm I'm ha happy to be part of, you know, if you want to feature me I'd, I'd love it it'd be pretty cool actually I'd be honored to tell you the truth <laughs> okay cool I'll put you on my list thank you and just so you know this is going to air I think on the 30th of this month okay so I'll send, okay I'll send you the link at that time so thanks again Carrie really appreciate it okay bye, bye for now